celebrating more than 60 years um, since the founding of African Studies at Indiana University in 1961. We have chairs up here, please. Um, so now more than ever, our scholarship, our outreach, and our pedagogy efforts carry the potential to impact the world in which we find ourselves. Our research transcends regional, disciplinary boundaries, promoting engaged collaboration with Africa-based scholars and the diasporas. Thank you for being here to mark this occasion with us. Um, so today's talk is part of our Spring 22 colloquium series. It's part of the Contemporary Africa Seminar series organized by Dr. Solimar Otero. The series will feature four talks by the following invited guests. Today we have Dr. Toyan Falola, the Jacob and Francis Sanger Mosaker Chair in the Humanities, Professor of History, University of Texas at Austin. Soon we'll be welcoming um, Dr. Francois Lyonnais, Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard University. Um, Dr. J. Lauren Vittori, the Lawrence Richardson Professor of Cultural Anthropology and African American African Studies at Duke University. And finally, in April, we'll welcome Dr. Aisha Beliso de Jesus, Professor and Director, Program in American Studies at Princeton University. Our events are supported by our Title VI National Resource Center grant. We thank the Departments of Folklore and Ethnomusicology, the Journal of Folklore Research, the Departments of Anthropology, African American and African Diaspora Studies, and History for additional support. Um, our colleague, Dr. Solimar Otero, will be introducing our speakers today. Um, Dr. Otero is Professor of Folklore and Ethnomusicology, and Director of the Folklore Institute, um, and Editor of the Journal of Folklore Research. Her books include Archives of Conjecture, Archives of Conjure, okay. excuse me, Stories of the Dead and Afro-Latinx Cultures, and with Dr. Toyan Falola, Yumoja, Gender, Sexuality, and Creativity in the Latino, Latino, and Afro-Atlantic diaspora, diaspora, Afro Diasporas. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Solimar Otero, who will introduce our guests today, Dr. Marie Hamilton Adnagunde and Dr. Toyn Falola. Thank you, Beth. It is my great pleasure today to be introduce, uh, introducing Dr. Maria Hamilton Abagunde. Dr. Abagunde is an assistant professor in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies. She is affiliate faculty in African Studies, Gender Studies, and with CRESS. Her research and creative work focus on memory, trauma, and healing in the African diaspora. Her most recent writings have been published in Trouble the Waters, Tales from the Deep Blue, Fire, Keeper of My Mother's Dreams, the Massachusetts Review, If My Body Could Talk, and the North Meridian Review. She's a Cave Canon Poetry Fellow and also received fellowships from the NEH, Ragdale, and Sakatar Foundation. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Abadoumi. Can you all hear me? Uh, I love the acoustics in this room, so that makes this easier. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so it is, I'm going to just do a little bit of an introduction, which I rarely do when I'm reading, but just for context, right? Um, just so you know, this is, in the two years since we've been in this situation, one of the first times, few times that I've been out, and this semester, one of the few times that I have been out aside from my class. Um, and so there's a reason for that. Um, one, Dr. Otero invited me, and I'll do almost anything for her. <laughs> so, so sister friend scholars, and Baba Falola was coming. And so, although I do not know Baba Falola um, personally, the work that I do in the world would be impossible without Baba Falola. Mm -hmm. And so I want to give gratitude to my elder um, for that, because it's not possible to do work anything about the Yoruba about Orisha, about African studies, African ways of knowledge without the work that Baba Falola does in the world. So I want to thank you, um, Baba, for that. So I'm going to read a poem um, as an introduction. And I was going to write something new, but then my great 
great-great-grandfather wanted to be part of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it made sense after I went back and read this and revised this in thinking about Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. right, and what that means. And so I'm thinking about Natasha Womack's work, right, as she talks about that Afrofuturism is a way to imagine yourself in the future in a way that gives you the ability to create agency, right? That it is to break past the limitations of our identities and ourselves. And it is a way to think about time in a non-linear format, right? We're thinking about African cultures and ways of knowing right? in a non-linear format to think about that, around self-liberation, self-healing, the technology and the mysticism and ways in which that we can actually imagine and change things, right? We can focus on what we want to see. So, let's see what it is. What it is that my great grandfather wanted to see and wanted you to see. And let's make sure that I can see. <laughs> For, and I should say my people are from the West Indies, from Grenada and Jamaica. For Robert Pupa Daly. Pupa, I have no memory of you except what I know after five years of living in the house you built before I was born. A concrete slab painted red on a plot of land close enough to smell the salt and see the Atlantic, wave her blue skirt in our faces, but far enough to save us from her wrath. Five years in the house that gave me my first earthquake, me shaking as much as the foundation, while Anita, your youngest daughter, my surrogate mother, whispers, don't move, it passing soon, this house, it never falls. Ten years later, I would search for the crack down the middle of the floor to prove to myself that I had in fact been a witness. Anita says, you were a big man, dark like plantains when they ripen, with long straight hair that fell below your shoulder blades, an Indian, the original Caribbean man, says you helped build the Panama Canal and left your name carved in all the stones you touched. She says you walked the Amazon singing your mother's songs, the ones she carried under her skin when she crossed the ocean with only the sound of your hearts as a prayer. Great grandfather, you built this house so I would never have to. Walked up from Brazil so I could follow your footsteps back to La Tass. Sang those songs loud so I would never be lost. Remembered what the Africans hid inside the tree so I would never think that forgetting was an option. The day I stood on the veranda and watched my first tornado world past me, watched it slow down and think for five minutes whether to rip up Satez or sweep over St. Vincent's. I understood your genius in making your children promise to not sell this land. I understood for the first time what it meant to be privy to miracles, to be chosen to live to be great-granddaughter to a man who left his name everywhere he went in things that could not be changed for centuries. What Amnita did not say, you were a shaman. You knew I would be coming, dreamed I would arrive right where I am. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Dr. Abagunde for that powerful piece. It is my great joy and pleasure to give Mojuba to Baba Falola. Toyum Falola is the professor of history, university distinguished teacher professor, and Jacob and Francis Sanger Mosica chair in the humanities at the University of Texas at Austin. He is an honorary professor at the University of Cape Town, extraordinary professor of human rights at the University of Free State. He served as General Secretary of the Historical Society of Nigeria, the President of the African Studies Association, Vice President of UNESCO Slave Route Project, and the Kluge Chair of the Countries of the South Library of Congress. He is a member of the Scholars Council Kluge Center, the Library of Congress, and he has received over 30 lifetime career awards and 14 honorary doctorates. He has written extensively on the humanities, including the humanities in Africa, knowledge production, universities, and the production of knowledge, and a forthcoming book by Rochester University Press, Decolonizing African Studies, Knowledge Production, Agency, and Voices. Professor Toya Falola is a celebrated author, editor, writer, poet, academic leader, organizer, teacher, pan-Africanist, and visionary of extraordinary grace, talent, and accomplishments. An author and editor of over 150 books, on Africa and the African diaspora. He has been invited to speak in all continents and in over 60 countries, and widely proclaimed as Africa's preeminent historian, one of the major intellectuals of our time. Many of his books have received awards, defined various fields, and inspired writings of various critical works. He manages five distinguished scholarly monograph series and serves on the board of over 20 journals. Being a global icon in African studies, Toyen Falola has received several honorary doctorates across the world. Ekabo Baba. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here, to be part of the glorious celebration of Indiana 60, which means that many of you here are younger than this center. <laughs> we can only pray that, like this center, you will grow in age and wisdom. It's a leading center for African studies, prestigious, famous, and its languages program are very well developed. Its libraries have been very useful to many people, including to me, and Indiana University Press has published six of my books. Uh, I think maybe the most published scholar of Africa with them. And then I have a contract with three books with them. One will be announced on African refugees. And I've signed a contract on global Yoruba with them. I cannot thank them enough for giving me these opportunities. I've been here several times. Uh, invited by the center and other bodies. I'm very grateful and um, I've collaborated with them when I was vice president of ESA with Maria towards the Emma conference at Indianapolis. We were worried that we won't get an audience. It was the first time, I think, that we hold a conference around here and in the Middle East. It was very well attended, and then Maria did a lot of work in doing that, and subsequently she did a lot of work for the African Studies Association. We cannot thank her enough, and I've been privileged to be an evaluator on two occasions for your Title VI applications. I cannot talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have great friends here thank all of you uh, for coming. Um, it was this afternoon that um, I was given the information that there may be students. I never, whenever you have students, you have to pay attention to the structure of the lecture. So this is part of a larger project. It was commissioned in two volumes by Bloomsbury. Bloomsbury and the Commission to write two books 
on this topic, looking at ideologies and theories and personalities. And I'm enjoying writing it uh, tremendously. Um, the way I structure the project is to do what historians do. You look at them in faces. And then each face opens up his own library. That's, that's a conception. Uh, by the way, Bloomsbury has entered the, Ameri the, 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 the African publishing market. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bloomsbury. They published the Harry Potter series and made a lot of money from that. Uh, they've acquired IB Towers and they've recently acquired ABC Clue. So it's, it's just with tentacles in Australia and Canada publishing with them. And I've, they've asked me to establish a series with them, which I've done around issues of creativity. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, we've released a book on Fela, Olisho Inka, and we have contracted books on Bob Marley, music, the area of creativity, in case any of you would like to be interested in that. So let me do the faces which I will speak to, and then I will read aspects of the more contemporary one. So, if we take this subject from the 19th century, the names keep coming back, they're not blinding, it just keeps coming back. Um, in my series with Rochester, we've just, asked, we've just signed a contract with another scholar who wrote on, on, on blinding. And the reason why it keeps coming back is that it's used as a major figure of the 19th century. Not the only one. But as that major figure, it frames the notion of 19th century modernity in a way that has endured for a long time. Um, and it framed it so beautifully well that the Inkuman notion of the triple heritage and the Masroi became more famous on that with his film series. Uh, actually hold to him. He was a Christian, he was a Muslim, he believed in tradition. And by the 50s, Nkrumah adopted that, and then Masroi made it bigger into his BBC documentary. But more importantly, he and his colleagues, Johnson, Randolph, Samuel Johnson of the Yoruba, they became pioneers in the use of literacy. And they began to write their ideas down. And in doing so, they became major cultural brokers and mediators, translating Europe to Africans and Africans to Europe, laying conditions that generated, as in the case of the Fante, written modern constitution. Uh, ideas around modernity, ideas around uh, various issues. And what they did was to fuse a variety of ideas, um, ideas around race issues, ideas around um, uh, the consequences of Europeans in Africa. But then in doing so, they raise the question, counterfactual. Suppose Europe did not conquer Africa, what will have happened? Historians in this room know that we don't like to pose the if question. <laughs> because it has, already, it has already taken place. So we can't say, suppose something has not taken place. But that does not mean that uh, we cannot handle that question. And it kept coming back. And when people accumulate developments in Ethiopia in the 19th century, including building an army that was able to withstand uh, Italy until Mussolini came back in the 1930s, the, the transformations in, in, 
Egypt, the great wars among the Yoruba that produced the city of my birth, Ibadan, which established the largest empire in the 19th century. The transformation in the savannah, with consequences still today, part of the coup that is ongoing, they are linked to some of those 19th century developments. And one of the, the one of the ultimate achievements of that period, the, the creation of the Sokoto Caliphate, 20 million people on its own, as a geographic space, it will be one of the biggest countries in the world. So when you accumulate all those, you say, okay, if all these processes were taking place, suppose they were not aborted, we don't know. Or if you move to the Fekane Shaka Zulu, you cannot do, you can't study war without Shaka Zulu, the idea of military nationalism, the draft, and things like that. Uh, people hold a lot of, of, of those ideas to Shaka Zulu. So they accumulate all this in some of the writings of the 19th century and thereafter. So what will have happened if Europeans did not come? And in accumulating those, you will see how those ideas became connected in the 20th century to the ideas of African reformation and the building of institutions without the European agency. And that's why the reading of that 19th century is very important. Because it was revived and it kept being revived in various, in various ways. By the time we got to Marcos Gave and Du Bois, we need a preface because there was a contest. Slavery in their writings, the colonial conquest in all their writings, and globalization. I won't waste your time elaborating on those. But that was a contest that drove the way they were thinking. But 19th century till now, you will read all this liberation this writing very well. Here is what they are doing. They are responding to the characterization of Africa without history. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we are the history. So that took a lot that took a lot of writing for them to do. Randolph was very successful in Ghana. The preeminent scholar where I come from is Samuel Johnson who finished his manuscript 1897, published 1921. Nobody has been able to match him. No one, because the successive academic writings on the Yoruba, they were all the themes that Samuel Johnson developed in that long book. Those were all his themes who were building upon. Uh, so, and then, by the time we moved to 1920s and 30s, they were responding to a second issue, Africa without change. You, you understand that trajectory. That's how Europeans have portrayed it in 1885. But for them, there will not have been change. And then we move further, post-colonial, Africa without development. They began to respond to that. And the most successful book is 50 years old. We're celebrating the book. I'm an editor of Journal of African Economic History, published by Wisconsin. I'm one of the co-editors. We are doing a series on what I wrote in how Europe underdeveloped Africa, 50 years. But that, that was the critical, that became the Bible to respond to that question. And then by the time we got to the 80s, Africa without governance. You remember, every political scientist, they began to say, let's do the matrix of governance. So I was, I was, that challenge was very frustrating, extremely. On Monday, you are, you are responding to the vampire state. By the time you finish writing your response, they've written Afri the irrelevant state. By the time you respond to that, <laughs> The predatory state. By the time they were just wasting our time in doing all this characterization of the state, no rest. At some point, when we, 
held a meeting in Estria in Senegal. We asked ourselves, why are we responding? Why must we respond? Because there is no end to that. And by the 90s, Africa without democracy, the democratic wave as that century closed. But behind mind as that century was closing, two great ideas emerged. The impending anarchy, the Atlantic. Many of you must have read that essay, very influential essay, that the place will implode and there will be cannibalism and some other things. And then that impending anarchy became followed by the idea of the recolonization of Africa. That was the trope, a lot of conversation that generated responses. And Masri began, for instance, why don't you do this internal recolonization? Divide Africa into five. Mm and let five countries, Algeria, Nigeria, South Africa, manage those five. He got into trouble, mm -hmm. but it was part of that trajectory. Yeah. And today, especially from the African side, not now Western side, Africa without hope. That's where we are now. I can understand why people think this way so many dimensions. And I use a very graphic example. If you study the Atlantic slave trade, you study it as a forced, a forced process, product of violence. Now, if you take that ship, call it Jesus. That was the name of the first ship that went to Africa to take the, the name of Jesus to take slaves. Take Jesus to Lagos. Tell people, look at the picture of the middle passage. They said, I will chain you down. I will do exactly what they did to you in the middle passage. And I will drop you in Virginia and on plantation. That, that ship will be full in two minutes. They will go. So, dramatically, follow the migration via the Mediterranean and have had the privilege to be part of conversation that involved the European Union and others in managing this, this traffic. People from Eritrea, the 3,000 Sahara Desert, with people will cross it as in the time of Mansa Musa with legs, with camels, to go where? Southern Europe. And you know the story, uh, the devastation. And that troop of Africa, of Africa without hope, people are now beginning to question issues around democracy. And you know, three days ago, another coup, and people are now beginning to say, with five, six coups, what are we going to do? Because democracy is not working. But the African record with respect to this democracy is not unique to Africa. And the way I explain it is the anger connected to modernity. Modernity that has been promised has been very difficult to attain. It's not an African thing. Afghanistan phenomenon, Venezuela phenomenon, India phenomenon. I spent one summer in India traveling among the Assamis. Modernity has produced anger, serious anger in different parts of the world. It's not just Africa, only that sometimes because this is what we do, we put an Africa to the face. But it's the same. It's the same. And you see, when we saw this anger of modernity come in Sierra Leone, Liberia, how will you give a wristwatch to a 17-year-old person with AK-47 and the gangster, you, gangster chain? Gangster chain, wristwatch, AK-47, 
want to kill people. So, uh, what do you tell a young person today not to use iPhone, not to use iPad? It has become very difficult. I'm not making it up. If you go to church as a Christian, the pastor will warn you, keep your cell phone very well. Because somebody is going to steal it in the, in, the, in the church, in the house of God. He steals it. The way he interprets it is, God has answered my prayer. He <laughs> <laughs> doesn't see it as theft. So you find that response to those variables. And then when you look at the context 19th century, early 20th century, they were responding to encounters. It is not an African story alone. There's nothing unique. Those tendencies will produce challenges of encounters. It produced in US history, it produced in China, it produced in India. People will respond. And as they were responding, they began to talk about their own tradition. And if you look at the conceptualization of tradition in liberationist thought, bear in mind it was not Africans themselves that began to use that terminology. Nobody wakes up and say, I am traditional. Nobody wakes up and say, I'm practicing traditional religion. It's a label that is imposed. But liberationist thought also contributed to that presentation of tradition. The cliche tradition is not against modernity, it's not the opposite. They contributed to that cliche. Because if, if you look at whether it's Ethiopian writing, whether it's South Africa, whether it's West Africa, they began to frame that notion of tradition. They crystallized it. They solidified. And the reason why they did is not difficult to analyze. Then you have, as we move to this century, the fusion of race issues with the European conquest. Black Marcos Gavin, Black to Africa movement, black awareness with um, black uplift. There's a considerable literature about black uplift. And the way they frame the argument has been very consistent. We are doing well. We were interrupted. We could do well again. It's, it's, it's a linear way of thinking. Uh, we can question the way it's constructed. And we can question the outcome. By the time you throw the boy into this project, the Pan-Africanist, uh, his book, The World and Africa, he didn't say Africa and the world. Remember, the world and Africa. We hold the boy a lot of gratitude because he rejected the framing of North Africa as not part of Africa. He rejected it. Bear in mind that when you teach African history, African days, the formulation of that Africa began with organic intellectuals. It didn't begin, begin with us. People like the boy framed this for us. You know, they began to talk about Mali Empire and Songa and Ethiopia before the academy. And in, in framing it, if you look at how Africa has been framed, it began to shape the Africa. Remember, the land of black people, the land of Sudan, Arabic framing. Remember Leo Frobenius, how they were framing Africa. And by the time we don't give them enough credit. And by the time they get involved, they began to frame Africa in a different light. And they began to frame uh, Africa in ways that are useful. So we can criticize them, no problem. 
because what they did was to take Western ideas of the nation state, Western institutions, and began to use that as a template to relate to Africa. I mean, and, and further down in later years, you began to see Western ideas in African writings. And the notions of modernity and other development, they were borrowing concepts. On the African end, bear in mind when they read this literature, sometimes they think it's original. But, some, but they don't know it is not. The reason has to do with what we have not studied, the currency and flow of ideas. I was giving a class lecture this morning, and I made the point that we don't have a media book that tracks these ideas from their sources. We don't. We, nobody has written that kind of book. The Bible and the transformation of mythologies in Africa, the Quran and the transformation of origin stories in Africa. We, we, somebody has to accumulate all this. By the time we got to the 20th century, they began to connect European Enlightenment ideas to explain Africa. So, so after 1885, the European institutions of governance did not owe to African ideas. It owed to their own historical history the car, plateau, all of those ideas. By the time those who are getting involved on the African side were writing about those, some of, read, some of them have already read that literature. My best example is a preeminent hero of Yoruba by the name of Obafemi Awolowo. He was a reformer. Part to Nigerian freedom, so many books. He went to London to go to school to become a lawyer. And he got involved in reading other books. Nkrumah read at more. If, if, you, if you read Nkrumah without understanding at more, you'll be giving him so much credit. So Awolowo was fascinated by Keynes, the great economist. And he became a clinician economist. And he began to read him. And he began to translate clinician ideas to Nigerian reforms and decolonization. So we have not fully approached the ideas from the books they've read. Sakanok wrote a book in which he did some of this, Philip. So one point is to say, where did you get this idea from? And as you are getting these ideas, by the time we get to the middle of the 15th century, they were contributing to many of these great ideas on the Pan-Africanist side, but they were also contributing to a disaster to come. So what happened? They began to read about the Soviet Union. So nobody has written any video essay on the impact of Bolsheviks on the African literary movement or cultural movement. That book is awaiting its first author. How they got, by the 60s, we knew how they got the ideas. Because they established the Lumumba University and began to ask Africans to come for free. We knew that era. But we did not know in the 50s and 40s, even on the African American side where they were, where they were communists. Nobody has really interrogated the sources of many of their ideas. They just knew they were communists. By the 70s, we knew where the ideas of how much was coming from in my school, with my generation, who we were, you can't go to university in the 70s and not know Marxism. Yes, so an early school. We knew all that. It is the earlier ones that we, do, we have not been able to fully grasp. But it is one thing to read in literature. Or, 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 
analysis are about interpretations. All forms of analysis are about interpretation. It is the interpretations we are putting into it. And I will just talk to three. The way they read the history of the Soviet Union after 1917 was different from the way the Bolsheviks were reading their own history. How? So 19th century, Hegel, Marx, workers of the world, unite, all those things, then Bolshevik Revolution. They were reading it as the following. You can manage a plural society if you use the Soviet model. Nobody knew that the Soviet Union is going to collapse. If you are from Nigeria today, and they gave you the Bolshevik document, you will agree with it. Because we are fighting every day. The only time when Nigerians unite is when they play soccer. <laughs> and I say, why don't you play soccer every day and solve the problem? Because the way they, the, the way they read that literature is that socialism could solve the problem of ethnicity. No. They didn't do so in Yugoslavia, they didn't do so in the Soviet Union, but they read it like that. They also read it in a very misleading way that you can transform societies within the generation. Whether it's Asikwe, whether it's Yomo Kenyatta, whether it's Ujama in Tanzania, they all drew that ideas that transformation was possible within the generation. It became not possible. But what it did was to create a false illusion about modernity and the ease to which it could be accomplished. It created a hope, a moment of hope, but it created a damage. We do not know, we have not been able to track the literature from Japan. It was not on the, until the 80s that we've been able to say, this is Japanese literature. But Japanese ideas began to trickle in into these writings from the 40s. Another misreading. Here is the way they misread it. The Japanese aristocracy of the 19th century was corrupt. The Suzuki, the Kawasaki, but it reformed itself, and in the 20th century, it transcended corruption, and within one generation, it transformed Japan with the advantage of culture. They were reading it like that. That, okay, what is wrong with, by the 50s, what is, what is wrong with stealing state money if you can become like the Japanese aristocrats? This is a real story. When they went to Nkuma in the early years of his presidency, the people were, you know, sir, you know, people were stealing money. So Nkuma used this analogy about the elephant. He said, when the elephant drops dead, you all bring your knives with your pocket and you just cut your own slice. You can't finish the elephant. I said, don't worry, don't worry. This is a big elephant. And it turns out not to be like that. So we have to accumulate the misreading. By the time we leave Pan-African movement aside, people sometimes think it's failed. No, it's not failed. It did not fail. It produced that solidarity. It did its own mission. It produced a homogenization of blackness. You all know that blackness is not homogeneous, but it did deliver that. Independence of Ghana, African Union, which later become uh, organization of African unity, which later become African Union. So for that moment, we cannot call it a failure. Anti-apartheid struggle. What happened is with the collapse of apartheid, it's been struggling. And all forms of revival have been problematic. One omission in the genealogy of this depression is taught 
is non-aligned movement. The reason is that some people read the non-aligned movement as a political strategy not to get involved in the Cold War. But there's a set of literature that has not been interrogated, which was reading the non-aligned movement as a liberationist struggle and an agenda. That one requires his own library. Why are you reading it? Because them but no meetings and others. The documents are there in which some of the original creators were saying, we don't want to be involved in the Cold War. But there is a minority literature that is now saying this is one way to solve Africa's problem. Of course, you know that did not happen. But why did it do that? There was a vacuum in the 70s. And that vacuum Witness of the OAU, witness of the Pan African movement. That vacuum was there and it was filled by two great ideas Marxism, dependency school. We can track the idea of Marxism. Good. That one is not difficult to track. Somebody has to write a book, Africa, Caribbean. Latin America and the configuration of intellectual ideas that unite. Because the dependency school came up, came from underground Africa. It came not from within Africa. It came from outside of Africa. By the time it got to Makerere, Madubelo University, they turned it into a school. School of Dependency Theory and School of Marxism. And, and there has been a wide range of critique. Because people homogenize these ideas. It's not correct. These ideas are variants and they fight. You can't just say Shimji and say Saul. No, no, they fight. They fight a lot. And then another idea now came from this part of Afrocentricity. It's been there before, Cheikh and Tadiop, you know his great story. And then Molefia Shanti of Temple University now turned it into a big idea, into a big uh, intellectual movement, later on into a project, Kwanza, and other things. Remember, she can a polymer. Was and it's good the name of the University of Tahim, but that's that's it deserves it. The boy we've struggled to name the University of Tahim. We have not been successful, which is unfortunate. He was interested in Egypt. By the time Molefi took it, he widened it to a concept of tying Western civilization, as Diop did in some ways, to Egypt, and created an argument out of Egypt. It was popular, but in some circles, it, 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 it lost some of its persuasive power when you begin to attribute so many things to ancient Egypt. People will say, no, no, no. But it attained its popularity. Like the previous Gave, it became connected to areas where Gave was important. Because they were reading it as an alternative way of reading history but was also an entire Western scholarship. <coughs> when any scholarship becomes connected to have two constituencies and their politics, you are going to create problems. 
And as these constituencies become connected uh, to politics, some people began to say, we are moving away from Afrocentricity. I've been talking too much about the past, and I want to turn to the present. And in turning to the present, I want to start with the Black Panther. Because the Black Panther was the most dramatic presentation. You can see the power of film, the most dramatic uh, presentation of this new cluster of ideas. The Black Panther. If you have not watched it, go watch it. If you have watched it, go and watch it again. Because what it does is not different from what Marcus Gabe Dubois did. It was the devices that were used. It's a juju. Black Panther is just juju, you understand? You, you, you fuse James Bond, right? With, with a cultural project. And in doing that, very successfully, you replace Senghor's negritude with technology. You, refer, you, you, you convert the African personality and kings right, to a hero, muscular, a fighter, capacity to use the bomb, right, and you fuse them. So you, you take the tropes in Pan-Africanism, all those tropes, and then you go to science fiction successfully, and you fuse them. What do you produce? Use an outcome similar to what the boy was talking about, similar to what Blyden was talking about, in which there will be this messiah with a technological power to deliver Africa. Not only deliver Africa, to also deliver revenge. <laughs> so, revenge as a trope, you are not going to find it in African literature. But I need to talk about it again because we need somebody to write an essay on it. If you, if you, if you are a colleague who do Iraq and Iran, you are going to find revenge as a trope. Because in saying we want Saladin, they're saying that the humiliation by the West, the Ottoman Empire, great Islamic civilization, and humiliated by technology, they're saying there will come a time when there will be revenge. This revenge variable, you are going to find in Islamic insurgency traditions. Remember, the lineage of those who participated in the jihad of the 19th century, people do not understand that in genealogy, they are related by blood to people like Yusuf, who started the Boko Haram. So there, there's a long lineage of saying, at what point in time, how do we resolve this issue of the secular state that is a big disappointment? So you can't understand Burkina Faso and Mali because without the to confront the jihadists. Three days ago, specifically, the Burkina Faso people said, you do not protect us from insecurity. And second, you are not unifying us. Because they are dealing with forces that revive the arguments of the 19th century. What is development? What does it mean? And why are you contracting development to the streets, asking the army and the police to go after us? That debate is there. And that current of the, the current of Islamic ideas, we have not been able to talk about them in relation to this subject. But because if you look at all the literature on 
liberationist movement, liberationist struggles, they do not factor in the ideas coming from Islam. And that is a big omission. And this omission is now represented very fully in the implosions in these places. To what, is, to what risk are you taking if you do not factor the idea coming from Islam? Because if, if you privilege Western secularist ideas, to what extent are you omitting other Islamic ideas? I will give you two examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. When they established Shokoto State University, and I was privileged to play a small part in its intellectual development, they said, go to Khartoum to look at the model of a university. Why Khartoum in Sudan? It's not as if the University of Khartoum has a, a good rating. <laughs> but they're saying, they don't go to the University of London or NYU, go to Khartoum. The project of a global academy here in mind, sometimes it's very misleading because the universal in the university is not global. The idea of establishing universities in Europe and the idea of establishing universities of other places, don't confuse them. Uh, and now they're saying, can we create a university that disconnects itself from the idea of Western universities and go to Petro? Part of what we have to do as we broaden this topic, as we teach it, is not to ignore the Islamic traditions and the liberationist ideology contained in it. And you saw the 19th century, the Mahdist movement in Sudan. That idea is not dead. It's not. But we do not study them enough. So today, in addition to that, Islamic ones, three ideas, cosmopolitanism, Afropolitanism, and Afrofuturism are what we are now dealing with. Is it, as some people have argued, the death of black nationalism? Some people are saying that it represents the death of Pan-Africanism, but I will fuse them, I will fuse them. It's an, it's, it's an overwhelming influence that grew in the diaspora. Uh, if some other ideas grew in Africa, this one grew in the diaspora. And it's, it emphasizes association with Africa on grounds of individual appreciation and self-modeling. Some will argue that don't confuse it with the bigger ideas of the nation state. Don't confuse these three ideas with what Du Bois was talking about, with what Blyden was talking about, that the emphasis is not about larger state projects, but about personal ideas and projects. And that some people have argued is divesting association with African personality on the ground of race and individualizes the African personality instead. And they, they, of course, there's so many definitions. Some are traced to Selassie's idea in Bye Bye Beda, and some are traced to the ideas of Achille in Bimbi. And there's a lot of arguments. One argument is that it calls for an opening of racial boundaries to African identity. Admitting that the African personality is traceable to the black man, but bearing the present realities in mind, that they can shed racial modes into which this personality has been pigeonholed. That which they said it can counter the ideas of negritude by saying, well, with the claim that racial dissolution uh, is either impossible and that 
what will make one an African is not the black treatment, but the sense of belonging and appreciation of multiple cultures. An ethos of transcending national differences, as Ndembe describes it, to forge multiracial communities. That is an emphasis on Africanism on cultural complexity, and it creates so many radical shifts. And it ties to a broad conception of speculative thinking, uh, rooted in the core of 19th century science-related racism, technology, and the agitation for African independence. The coming of a secession from and the response to Eurocentric projects of the 20th century. To assume Futurism is characterized as a program to recover the histories of counter futures created in the century hostile to what they call Afro diasporic projects. In the advent of Afrofuturism, the issue of diaspora left behind by the Afropolitan was revisited, and they began to debate how. Afrofuturistic thought will bring about the fundamental ideas of Africanism, the historical links between people, and the challenges of reconstruction. And the major conference that has been credited for this re rethinking was held in Ghana in 2017. So when you accumulate this conflicting literature, you find how Afrofuturism is best characterized in two perspectives. First, viewed as an African liberationist thought with historical roots in preceding African liberation movements, but with its own unique objectives, approaches, and applications. Second, which some of which preceding ideas did viewed as an arts and science movement, similar to the Renaissance or Victorian age. And some people have seized this latter and create an awareness, as in the case of the Black Panther film, as speculative fiction. Uh, and in that speculative fiction and speculative ideas, you will see the difference in generations between me for instance, schooled in the Du Bois ideas, and my daughter schooled in science, technology, and speculative fiction. Sometimes we can't just bridge, we can't just bridge the divide. So in all previous African liberationist thought, they emphasized the overwhelming influence of European colonization. They all did. And the trajectories of the continent and the impact of the diaspora communities. But Afrofuturism sought to de-emphasize those colonial impacts. They de-emphasize it. For instance, Wakanda world, the Black Panther world, bereft of the complexity of a post-colonial African society, it divorces the Eternal themes of colonialism in its narration, a complete departure from the African, from the original African liberationist touch. Why the African liberationist element of Afrofuturism has been strongly established, the view of Afrofuturism as an art and science movement is sometimes difficult to articulate. And you can read as many literature on it as possible you will still be saying, what are the differences in the way they think and what they have articulated? And, and the black speculative arts movement is one phase of it that we should pay attention to. And that the BSAM has flourished uh, in so many 
circumstances. Afrofuturism and Afropolitanism, although some scholars disentangled them, seek to create a new culture now, a new phenomenology of Africanness, a way of being African in the world. While Afropolitanism obliterates the space barrier in defining Africanness, Afrofuturism obliterates the time barrier. One does the space, the other does the time. Thus, the Africanist ideas from Pan Africanism down to Afropolitanism continue to define and direct trajectories of Afrofuturism. Let me do the link. And this link, whether it will be accepted or not, I don't know. But this is the way I've crafted it. Linking 19th century from blighting Afro Pan Africanism, Afrofuturism, Afropolitanism, I want to do the link. During colonization, Pan Africanism felt the impacts of colonialism and racial injustice against black people and set an objective of bringing persons of African descent together, preferably with their return to Africa. That one was clearly established. Afropolitanism obliterates the perceived otherness of the other African diaspora and promoted cultural appreciation irrespective of space. The third leg, Afrofuturism argues for a new way of defining Africanness in terms of art, science, and technology that promote the full facet of the African essence, rather than based on the usual, perhaps racist themes of colonialism, savagery, and destitution, while also obliterating the time barrier. In all this, Whether it's Pan Africanism, Afrofuturism, Afropolitanism, you find the issue of agency, the agency of Africa to rethink its own world, to reshape itself. And it is in that agency that I want to close this conversation. And I will close it by saying that two things at this moment in history. We understand, we understand the impact of the West and Arabs on Africa. We fully have done that very well. But what we have not done is the impact of Africa on the West. How the West on the develop Africa, Chinwesu, the Western Africa is an entire library that has been created. I've argued that we need Western, the study of the West centers in Africa, just as you have the African Studies Center in Indiana. The University of Pretoria has now created the study of the United States in Africa as a project. But my ideas are far more extensive than this. And in my own idea, as I said, we need to accumulate the impact of Africa on the Arabs and the West. Because the library is rich, only that we have not done it. Check the Islamic world. No sooner than Islam introduced into Africa, and it was accepted and they were producing the knowledge, then they began to transform that knowledge. People do not know that there was an extensive traffic of African preachers to North Africa and the Islamic world. People don't study that. Neither do people connect the four to African studies. Because the four had a large immigrant population from West Africa who was stranded while going on the pilgrimage. And in the final analysis, you know the history of how Sudan broke into two. The North, 
describing himself as Afro Arab, the South as African, with a lot of intellectual debates that we could not resolve. I had the privilege of serving on the, on the peace initiative in Sudan, and it was extremely complicated, very, very difficult. We have not studied that interaction between Sudan, Boronu, Niger, and see what Africa has contributed. Neither have we studied the intellectual contributions of Africans to the Middle East and to North Africa. But it does exist. At least you know the interaction in the Sahara. That one, Bagdutu, Canada, that one has been clearly established, but not studied, which we have to do. Because the flow into this conversation of where these ideas come from and the extent to which these ideas draw into political conversation and struggles and spaces and conflicts and violence. We have not done that. And we have to do that. We have not also studied Africa as an agency in the West. Our colleague at Princeton wrote a book on slavery and modernity in Europe. But we have to do more than that in terms of saying how, what is the impact of this African, not just migration, ideas in other spaces. We know as of today, we can't write about Brexit without immigration. That's not possible. We can't write about Trump without immigration. We know that. To what extent are the ideas that are being generated influential? Many of you have read black literature. You've read about Equano. And now they plug Equano into black literature. But cumulatively, the long established literature coming from what I've spoken today coming from African scholars have not been integrated into the American academy. We have not done that. So, so take a point, oh, that's one piece that's integrated, but people have written a lot. People have written a lot over the years. But the way we create African studies and black studies, they are not coherent. So consequently, the benefit we can derive in understanding the topic of this nature, we have not fully profited from it. And it is a challenge that maybe when we do Indiana at 120, we'll also be talking about the African thought in Western epistemologies. Thank you very much. century, and I do Ibadan in the 19th century. Both of us are doing area studies. So, we're empowered by area studies, but we also suffer some limitations deriving from it, uh, which all of you as colleagues know. And the problem has escalated. It 
just escalated, and I will explain it. So, when I was in graduate school in the 70s, I don't think they will let you surpass without reading widely and regionally. But bear in mind, these books are not many. You can actually, if you are a serious student, you can actually read like half of them. <laughs> so, I, can, I, I read all the books on East Africa, South Africa, Birmingham, Trimingham, Kabul, and you read all of them. Then, the show became bigger and bigger. And then fragmentation follows. And this fragmentation is how other fields, other disciplines are also pressuring African studies. So in my time, it was regional. Now, I don't think there's anybody now who can read all this literature. It's not possible. Environment, sexuality, trade, nobody can do that. So, but there is a, a bigger challenge. When I entered the academy, getting a book published was very difficult. The publishers were not many. They were not many. They established some schools, Legon School, Ibadan School. Today, there's nobody with manuscripts that will not have a publisher. None. So these publications are so many. And uh, because of production on demand, because now you can publish a book that sells 80 copies, nobody would do that in the 70s or 80s because you have to warehouse them. Today, you don't need a warehouse. You know many of the books you buy, it is when you send to buy them that they produce some of them. Because technology now allows you to produce one book. And, and that is creating its own problems in increasing the challenges that we have. If you can wake up and publish something, whom are you going to blame if nobody reads it? And then we're now creating a book of just the, the, you do Namibia only, you are not speaking to only those who do Namibia. And somebody who writes on Ghana or Nigeria may not even bother to read your work. And that is where we are now. I, here is my argument. And this argument, I mean, The most important work is the PhD thesis. I'm not, I don't want to get into trouble with professors. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to transform any academy, the fastest road is to let them produce quality PhD, right? Because within six years, if you get 10 students, within six years, they can transform a field. That was how they did it in Legon at the University of Never mind, there were not many. They just took a dozen prize students, right? And then they transformed that intellectual space. So in rethinking this, we have to rely on a new generation of graduate students like you, right? Who have to rethink the discipline uh, with quality scholarship. And, and we take it from them. Take, take, take. Afrofuturism, Afropolitanism. You know, this, this is a project of young people. It's not a project of people of my generation. It's a product of people in the 20s and 30s. And if you broaden this conversation further, the uplift of Africa, as I stand before you now, that holds for four things, it is made possible by people in their 20s and not the knowledge from the university. Today, they've created the Yaba Valley of coding. You now find so many Africans with the capacity for coding. They teach themselves. They can code. And
and how companies are recruiting them. If you go to Nairobi, they know how to code. It is not universities that taught them. Then check the film industry. Nollywood is the third biggest industry in the world. It's not the product of the universities. Mm -hmm. It's the product of young people, right? Fashion design. Check the music industry. I mean, two of them were nominated for the Grammy last year. One won it. It is not the universities. It is the way in which young people in their twenties and thirties are now taking this challenge to create alternative ways of thinking. Right? Connecting it not to ideas of tradition, the way the way I was brought up. They're not connecting these ideas to tradition as I did in my generation. But they are connecting it to what they call futuristic idea. 35% of Bitcoin in the world is controlled in Lagos mm -hmm. by young people. You understand? In which you say, what are you talking about this witchcraft? Uh, kingship. <laughs> <laughs> you are throwing them away. <laughs> and as you are throwing them away, they are creating new forms of scholarship. But we have to take them seriously. So when you go to Namibia, you are not just connecting yourself to the archives. You have to connect yourself to these young people. Because, uh, say, I was teaching my class after my PhD, I think second or third year I did too. And they gave me a course to teach on African civilization. I got my PhD on the 19th century. Not in the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was young. I don't, I don't teach from lecture notes. I teach from my... And I, I, I just finished teaching a long history of Egypt. And this young man said, he wants to ask me a question. He said, what do I want him to do with the pyramids? That you can't build a bridge. There's a gutter in front of the hostel. That what do, what do I want him to do with this scholarship? You understand? That was 1982. Now that kind of question, there are now so many in the African Academy. What do you want me to do with this Mali Empire? What do you want me to do with this culture? Why are you asking me to listen to this song? Why can't I create? You know, Follow the music these boys listen to. Why are you asking me to? Why are you asking me to think this way? And as they break that process of thinking, that's how cosmopolitanism can develop. That's how Afropolitanism developed. That's how Afrofuturism were developed. They were developed not in the crucibles of African universities but outside of the continent, you understand? In Germany, in London, in New York. And that's how they develop them in ways that they are now forcing all of us to rethink this subject. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that the integration of African studies and black studies isn't always even, and I wanted to know what were like the three or four main issues for that? For the lack of integration? Yes. Very good. Some of them are very sensitive. So I have to be very careful. Mm. So, remember the boy, right? Remember his project was to s connect Africans, African Americans. Remember, that was a project of Pan Africanism, right? Remember Senghor, negative. African personality, my emotions are not tied to structures. My civilization is not in cathedral, mm -hmm. but in my thinking. Remember all that. There was a moment that produced that. And that moment began to decline because African leaders joined Pan Africanism. When they got power, right, they were
are not fully committed to that project. That's one level. The second level, we can track African immigration to the US. It was a small number. During the Nigerian Civil War, they granted asylum. This number began to increase. Now we are two million. And the projection is that we will double every five, five years by almost a million or two million. The Africans who came were not connected to the civil rights movement. They, they were not connected. So there have been various movements of Africans. If we don't organize them, there's the Africans diaspora of slavery, right? There's the Africans diaspora of colonization. You, so, Obama does not belong to the diaspora of slavery. You understand? Remember the argument was not black enough. Now, there's the diaspora of structural adjustment program that produced me the Betty Woods institution that led to the decline and collapse of the African economy, Latin American economy. What did that do? Migrations, right? The diaspora of structural adjustment, they are not connected to all this idea of one of if you ask them who is Martin Luther King, they may not be able to answer because they are not connected with that. And that has created his own friction. You understand? Also, remember, and we don't have studies of race, we have one in media book. Remember that Africans understand ethnicity, not race. So, so. The way they see privileges in society, they have a richer understanding of ethnicity, but a weaker understanding of race. So that in confrontations with African American identity, they are unable to connect with that intellectual trajectory very well. They are not able to connect with it. And remember, at this very moment, and we are not teaching it, transnationalism. Mm. Remember, the diaspora of slavery was permanent. They wanted to do black African movement. It didn't work out. The diaspora of the 80s and 90s, are, these are transnationalist projects in which they live in multiple worlds. If you go to Little Lagos, there's Little Lagos in Los Angeles, there's Little Lagos in Houston. We call them Little Lagos. <laughs> because they have, you know immigrants, they cluster. It's not just Africans. Somalis, they cluster. People from England, they cluster. Africans also cluster. Chicago, Baltimore, Dallas, Houston, they cluster. So Little Lagos refers to a concept of clustering in which what you do, you are not inserting yourself to the culture of your host. Rather, as people who study Candomblé and Sintere and Vodou do, you are leaving the culture you left behind. Illustrate. If you are an African today, you don't have to eat American food for the rest of your life. Because globalization has delivered food from Ghana and food from Nigeria. You don't have to watch Hollywood for the rest of your life. Cable television has delivered African film. You don't have to listen to American films. And if you live in Houston, you don't have to be f have a f an Hispanic or white person as your friend. So if you look at the earlier literature under the boy, the writings of Africans, they were talking about alienation. Alienation, alienation. Who, who talks about alienation now? I live in Austin. You can, you can say 2 p.m. You want to go to Lagos. Just walk to the airport. You'll be in Lagos 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, so without that concept of, and you can see where Selassie, Asha, they are coming 
you can see how they were able to formulate these theories of Afrofuturism, Afrocosmopolitanism, because they work in spaces different from as if we writing my Odyssey. I am so frustrated. I want to commit suicide. I'm not making it up. That is his memoir. He wanted to kill himself. He, the best way to kill yourself is to use a gun. Because by the time you hear the shot, you're already dead, right? <laughs> so he chose the worst method. He went to a rail line and he lied down, thinking the train would crush him. You're going to get up, which he did. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so I, I, you see that, whether it's in London, you see how anytime you homogenize these realities, you're already making a big mistake. My children, my grandchildren, and myself, you can't homogenize that identity. It's not going to work. You understand? Because, because those identities are structured differently. My son's wife is from Greece. If, if, if you hear Temaxicus Falola, Leonardo Falola, you will think they're not Africans. <laughs> My daughter, Chinese. You understand? My last daughter, French Canadian. Mrs. Francis, if you see Mrs. Francis, are you going to associate him with the Yoruba person? That is a problem. Oh, no, sorry, I don't want to say problem. That is how new identities have emerged. So, as I said in a class today, I wrote The Power of African Cultures in the 90s, translated into Portuguese. I asked people not to read the book anymore because it just doesn't work because I was framing culture in terms of how it was defined as traditions, as this and as that. You no longer can define culture now outside of globalization, popular culture. The differences between your students at Indiana and University of Cape Town and University of Johannesburg and you ask your papers, don't exaggerate them. They listen to the same music. They wear the same clothes. When I was in school, you can't wear shorts. Your professor will ask you to get out of his class. Mm -hmm. You understand? They dress the same way. Do you know that they eat the same food? Family of spaghetti and bacon. You think a student from the University of Lagos just wake up and say, I want to eat cassava? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why they can formulate alternative ways of thinking. You understand? Now, let me now move that the world has not seen this phenomenon before, the creation of NGI, non-governmental individuals, you understand? Several millionaires control the economy of India, you understand? Just to use that example. There are people who can buy many African countries. The revenue Gambia is 250 million. Michael Dell will live in the same city. He can write a check to buy Gambia. You understand? What we now have with NGI is that they now formulate a global elite reading the same book, wearing the same food, drinking the same wine. They are formulating ideas among those global elites that also complicate the way we think. When Rangote's daughter or son got married, do you know who was there? Big Kate was there. Do you understand? 
So when you have these new ideas, you can't just wake up and say, I'm using a, a conventional tradition to write about African culture. If you write it and Dangote reads it, he's not going to see himself there. It's not. Because and, and part of what I'm trying to do with all these examples is that we have to rethink. <coughs> we have to rethink all these ideas. And I can't just wait. If you ask me now, if, if you go to Lagos and say, define an African. There are Africans who don't speak African languages. There are Africans who don't eat African food. So, and in this world, as important as Blyden and Nkrumah and Boy are, and we, we hold them a lot, we also have to admit that as we create the genealogies, 